Hi, it's Katie here in Seattle with a quick note about today's show. I've been thinking a lot about what I might want to do and where I might want to go when this pandemic abates, and I'm sure you have too. But I've also been thinking about the world itself and the creatures that live beside us and far away from us and all of the space that we humans take up that we should be sharing better. I love sounds, and if you listen regularly, you know that. And many of you even discovered sounds like the birds right outside your window over the last two years. And my guest today really loves sounds as well. He's made a profession of it. And today through sound, he'll introduce us to the animals that we take for granted and the animals that we love, like a lion, for instance. or an elephant he also captures animals as they disappear from earth forever you'll hear some of those creatures today too so this is a note that this episode contains ideas and sounds of great beauty and wonder and also some ideas and sounds that are hard to hear. So choose your timing right of when to listen, but it is an unforgettable conversation, for me at least. In the weeks since I spoke with Martin Stewart, I've been thinking differently about the world and who we are in it. So here we go. Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. Tiffany is away this week, but I'm joined by Martin Stewart. He is a sound and nature recordist, born in Birmingham and living in the United States. Over the last 55 years, he's built up one of the largest collections of natural sounds in the world. And he's recorded in more than 55 countries, collecting more than 90,000 different sounds. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. So how many hours of material would you say that you have? Oh, um, I'm doing a project with Apple. And what they've done is they've agreed to preserve my sounds and stick them up in the cloud. And as we were transferring data over... It took something like six weeks to get it up there. Um, And I think there's somewhere around about 50,000 hours of natural sound, 97,000 stem files. And as you say, from 55 different countries, plus, you know, that's, that's what I know of. There's other little countries that pop up now and again when I get asked to do a, a recording or send the sound out. And then I forget that I went there. So... The other day I was looking at Luxembourg and I thought, oh yeah, there's another country there. So um, probably 60,000 hours of natural sound spanning, well, over my lifetime. So, I mean, obviously we can't name everywhere you've been, but give us an idea. What are some of the places that you've recorded in? Well, if I say we have six continents, I've done six continents and that encompasses Australasia, um, Antarctic, well, it kind of fringes on there. Argentina, South America, Central America, Northern America, Asia, most of Europe, and wherever else I've left out. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, I mean, what's it like to see the vast majority of the world? I feel like that's something most of us don't get to do. It's uh, it's the most educational thing I think you can can accomplish. I think education travel is education you can travel around the world and get to know various cultures um something i learned in america when i landed on these shores in 96 was very little people knew where places were and if they looked out the window in nasa and saw all this beautiful place you know that lasted being able to travel Uh, to all these places was 
something I, I never thought, well, I'm going to go to Easter Island today and I'm going to see what the weather's going to be like. It was a, a mission that I would go and do. And all I was worried about was capturing the data that I want. So a lot of places I missed out on seeing the, the other beauty. But places like North Africa, you go into the dryness in the deserts and you go from the, the north to the middle where you've got beautiful lush jungles and savannas. And then down into Australasia where you've got gorgeous rainforests up into Borneo across to Palau and even in North America you know there's some of the most gorgeous places I think I've ever been to and you have such a great sized country that you could say 50 of those states are like going into different countries they're all different yeah they really are I guess it would be impossible when you've seen so much of the world to pick like a favorite region or can you oh I can't do that <laughs> I, I love going back to the UK is a is a magical thing and I like to recharge my batteries but for species recording you want to go and do the loudest and the most density and the most number of species you can find so I think Costa Rica is a gorgeous place you know if you go down to Costa Rica you can more or less walk into the the jungles there and record something beautiful as soundscape and there's not a lot of traffic or sound from planes that break the soundscape. But I think anywhere that's that's temperate and moving to tropical is my favourite. But I I normally say people ask me what's my face favourite recording that I've made, and I always say it's the last one I did because I achieved something. So I suppose the best country that I've been to is the one that I went to last. <laughs> right. So you're you're going to these different places on assignments, or are you choosing where to go? How are you ending up in these different places? Some are assignments, some are by choice. I did a a job for the BBC back in 1990-something, 92. And what I decided to do was to go and record all the bird species in the world. And I'm not a birder, I'm not an ornithologist, I'm none of those. But um, I recognised there was something like 10,000 species on the planet. (laughs) And I thought, okay, that's a lot of places you've got to go so I looked at things like where the endemics were the difficult ones I went down to the Robinson Crusoe Islands down in Chile and a place called Selkirk out there I went to record the fire crown hummingbird and I was there for 10 days and all I got was wing flaps it wouldn't vocalize it it has kind of these these things about it but um the countries around the world are just mag- magnificent. You know, they're absolutely tremendous places to be. And the world is shrinking. We have 7.8 billion people on making a lot of noise. Mm-hmm. So I'll just add as well that most of my library, probably two thirds of my library now is extinct. You can't replicate that anymore. You can't go back and record what was what used to be. And such is the the amount of human made noise that is just making the earth a noisy place. What do you make of that? That fact in general, two thirds of what you recorded is gone on its face is just very depressing. Well, years ago, I I knew a naturalist by the name of Gerald Durrell. He used to have a zoo on the Channel Islands in the UK. And I met him when I was down there. He was just an incredible guy. And he said that what you never want is to have your sounds end up in a museum or a, a library or somewhere where you can just push a button and say that's the sound of a polar bear or whatever. And that came to its fruition that uh, now there are sounds in museums that I've recorded that are extinct now. And I just found out the other day there's another species I have which has been made extinct in 2021 the Bachman warbler 
And I recorded that in 1999, just outside Charleston. So three species that I've recorded are now in museums where you push a button. The northern white rhino. The Hawaiian crow. The Panamanian tree frog. And now no doubt the Bachman warbler will end up the same way. So, as soundscapes go, we don't think of sound becoming extinct, but if years ago I could stick a, a microphone out on the Serengeti and just record this beautiful soundscape, and now they've put a road right through so that it breaks the soundscape. You have trucks and all sorts of stuff. In the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge when I was up there, on the Canning Delta I was recording, I could hear Prudhoe Bay 60 miles away with the oil drilling. When it first started to happen to me, I found it very upsetting and I didn't know how to deal with it because it was my world that, that was being encroached on. And if I wanted 20 years ago to record one pristine hour of sound, CD quality, you know, that way with little edit, it would take me about three or four hours to make that one hour. And today, that takes me about 2,000 hours to record that one hour. Such is the, ma the magnitude of noise that comes in. I did some audio guides for the Pacific Northwest, and it was the birds of the Pacific Northwest. And to record the rock dove, which is just an urbanite, took me two weeks to do 20 seconds. Yes, the pigeon as we mistakenly call it, right? Yeah, the pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pigeon. Yeah, I... It went from pigeon to dove, back to pigeon to dove. Well, is there any value to recording them in their soundscape as noisy as we're making it now recording the pigeon sitting on the side of a busy street in downtown seattle um anybody can do that now <laughs> try and record a pigeon without a bus going past is a lot difficult yes so the challenge is go out and get a recording of a pigeon without the sound of a car or a bus or cell phone interference even that you know mm. That can interfere in recording. Yeah, that's interesting. Since we both work in sound, and I used to train interns, and I was trying to get them to think with their ears rather than with their eyes. Yeah, yeah. I would send them out with a recorder and say, bring me back 10 sounds, and one of them cannot be traffic. <laughs> because <laughs> cause if you just put them out, they'd record the first bus that went by. You know? I don't need any more buses. Like, get me something else. You know, I used to, I used to um, teach recording soundscapes with the University of Washington and we had a nature sound recording class for 20 years and I was with a professor by the name of Mark Oberly who is a great friend of mine and when we would teach people they would hear birds on the Mont Lake Phil is it mm -hmm. yeah the Mont Lake Phil out there and they'd say wow there's a loggerhead shrike singing away it's just great we should record it so I said Put a microphone out there, put your headphones on, and then listen to the bird again. And then when they would do that, they would listen to everything coming across the bridge. And they couldn't believe how noisy the environment was. And what we do with our minds is, when we listen to stuff, we filter that out and we just focus on the sound we're listening to. Whereas a microphone doesn't discriminate, it just gets everything that's out there. And suddenly... They were becoming as depressed as I was. <laughs> so what do you do about that depression, though? Because this is the world that we live in, and obviously we can work to try to change it and to make it better, but it is, you know, sometimes it feels like it is just so far gone, and how, how do I, Katie, do anything about that? Well, we have to create awareness. We can reduce our footprint or ear print. We can reduce the sounds. We can drive less if we wanted to. I think through sound, it tells a huge story. The thing I used to say the most was, a picture tells a thousand stories, but sound tells a thousand pictures. And we used to sit as kids, you know, listening to the radio, 
and have in our minds this whole thing that was just, you know, like this theater that was going on and our minds were able to do that. What I have is sounds over 55 years that used to be. So all of those species that I wanted to get have been captured with less noise, man-made noises. But there are still places out there that you can go out quiet and just record. It gets harder, but the tools to go and do it, like Google Earth or Google Maps, and you can go and see places where you can get to the center of a place and measure the nearest road or you know, motorway or freeway, whatever you call it over here. But you never give up hope. There's, there's always a place that you can go into a quiet sanctuary and do that. They're just shrinking, that's all. We've lost something like 80% of wild spaces in my lifetime. Today's show is sponsored by Sambucol. There's nothing more important than taking care of yourself. If you're not feeling your best, it's hard to be your best. Sambucol offers powerful immune support with nature's superfruit, black elderberry. My neighbor was the first person to tell me about black elderberry. She loves it so much that she even advertises elderberry on a sign in her front lawn. Nothing makes her feel better, she says. And Sambucol makes taking elderberry easy. I've been trying the elderberry gummies. They are extremely tasty. They almost taste like a dessert. I just add them to the vitamins that I take every morning. If you want to give it a try, you can get 15% off your order of $9.99 or more at sambucolusa.com. When you're there, use the promo code bittersweet15. That's sambucol, spelled S-A-M-B-U-C-O-L, sambucolusa.com. And use the code bittersweet15. Now, back to the show. Would you say that you, with the five senses, would you say that you lead with your ears? Is sound your first thing? Sound is always my first thing. Was it like that even when you were little? Yeah, because it it's what got me into it at the age of 11. There was some great stuff that you could hear. You didn't have an ATV or a, a snowmobile when it snowed. And traffic and stuff... There was never the infrastructure. I was luckily enough to live on a council estate and across the road was a green belt that went for miles. And there used to be this beautiful bluebell wood and in the middle of the field was a, was an old oak tree where an owl used to sit on there every night and hoot away. So at 11, my ears were, were my sanctuary and I just loved everything that, that made sounds except for a baby crying or a guy screaming or a horn blowing right i didn't like that but i used to lay on my back and listen to the skylark descending and ascending and this beautiful melodious song that it would do and i think if i wasn't able to hear that again if i had to have the choice i obviously we're a visual species, but if I had to have the choice of losing the eyes or the ears, I would, uh, I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> Keep both if possible. <laughs> yeah. Since you uh, have been in these wild places or in all these different countries too, does it take bravery to do that? You never know what you're going to encounter. I've had a machine gun in my face. I've had a, a knife in my throat. I've had a mountain lion ripped my ear off I've had a crocodile dive out of the Masamuri at me and I've done double somersaults to get out of the way and places like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge where you're dumped into this wilderness and suddenly you see a bear walking through the tundra and you think I never thought about this so every place has its has its challenges I think the biggest challenge for me is man. I'm not so much bothered about animal danger. I think if I became that way, if I became aware of tigers eating me or elephants trampling me and stuff like that, I, I'd never go and do what I've done. But man frightens me more so. How so? Well, you can be out somewhere in, in a place that someone's pissed off about and 
get shot. I mean, I was on the Rio Grande River in Texas one time and I was recording this beautiful southern soundscape when uh, illegals were crossing a river and because one got startled and I'd seen them, there was a confrontation because he didn't want to know that I knew he'd crossed the river. So there was a verbal exchange there and it could have got worse, you know. I was on the uh, skeleton coast in Namibia recording the seal clubbing, which was pretty horrendous. It was pretty horrific. And it was shoot on site if you were trespassing on there. And there's signs all the way around the border of the place. And I just took the chance to just go out there. It's a good cure for constipation when you've got a gun in your face. Yeah, not the, not the cure you'd be seeking, though, certainly. <laughs> no, no, no. But why did you do that? I mean, is that bravery or is that just your curiosity? What would you, how would you describe yourself? Well, I, I'm an activist as well as a naturalist. And I, I stand up for the animals. I, I try to give the animals a voice. I've recorded situations across the world to give the animals something to say. Like we went out to the Gadamai festival out in Nepal. And there's a festival where they sacrifice up to 500,000 mammals by decapitating their heads as a sacrifice for their goddess. I wanted to record the experience. Although the visual was something horrific you don't want to see something like that happening the sounds itself kind of transported me into every time I listen to that it transports me into that situation where I get that kind of smell about it but I wanted to create awareness and there was me and Jane Goodall and Joanna Lumley and a bunch of other people that were trying to get the festival stopped I recorded in Taiji in Japan where the dolphin massacre goes on between September and March and they kill up to anything around 20,000 dolphins and these beautiful sentient beings are just corralled into this infamous cove area and select the ones they want to train and send off to places like SeaWorld then they slaughter the rest to record something like that you have to focus pretty hard on it because you can collapse, you you can fall apart. There's a, a discipline that you have to stay with. But when you listen to 90 dolphins echolocating in confusion and then suddenly there's nothing left except the sound of snapping shrimp, it's a powerful message. The sound of bears having bile extracted from their bodies for Asian medication is it's horrible. It's horrible. The clubbing of seals in Namibia for their for their pelts. So I find that my place on Earth, I have to pay the rent to that, so that I can live here and and justify what I do. In describing you being there recording it i mean two questions come to mind one how do you think that if even just watching it is such a horrific sight which i can imagine it is how do you think that other humans are able to do it i mean i don't know how they're affected by it obviously but how do you think that they're able to do it i don't i don't know you know i think if you watch a butcher how does a butcher butcher a carcass you know takes a chicken and chop its head off and do all that and dress up something for a supermarket to be put into a plastic container. Um, Believe me, when I've I've gone and worked on these projects, I come back and I, I have to clean my soul. And normally what I do with that is I'll lay with my dog and stroke the heck out of it, you know. And there are special people, I think, out there, far better than what I am. I think those who video things, I was talking to a couple of cameramen, and how do you do this stuff? And 
what one of them said to me was they look through the viewfinder and it's it acts as a filter if they actually pull the camera away and watch it for real without looking through a lens it becomes a different situation it's a different scenario with sound i've got headphones on and i'm concentrating on writing down a, a time code when certain things happen so i'm concentrating on the thing i sat out in zimbabwe as a, a rhino was tranquilized and then butchered for its horn and the screams of that animal i couldn't do anything about it but when I'd done it, you know, back in the hotel room or back in the truck where it was, I cried like a baby. So, but again, it, it's a duty that you need to do. In the old days, you watch documentaries, wildlife safaris and stuff, and the, the lion runs after the gazelle. And everyone turns away and turns it off or puts on another show or something because they don't want to see that. And it's still an element of that. People don't like to see animal abuse. They don't want to see that at all. But then they'll lead to Turkey or something for Christmas and then they'll have something. You know, and this, these beautiful animals. I, I haven't eaten an animal for 30 years. I always said, you know, I wouldn't eat what I record. It takes something. You, you have kind of like these rooms in your mind and you have to walk into these rooms and be able to discipline yourself to be able to do the job. But the, some of the sad things, not just about seeing animal abuse and seeing animals uh, diminish, is knowing that we could save this stuff if we just woke up. If we agreed to say we're not the only species on the planet, you know, we need to have all these other animals with us. We don't want to just keep shooting them and not understanding them or being afraid, afraid of spiders or afraid of wasps and stuff. Everything has this kind of purpose that's there and we really need it. And we released a whole bunch of sounds through Apple and Spotify and stuff. And, and what I want to do before this bone cancer takes me over is put as much stuff out there that people can enjoy and say, you know, let's protect what we have left. It needs to be done. Yeah. What is that going to take? Because I feel like we, we've been hearing that also from a lot of the young people, of course, lately have been doing all their environmental walkouts and, you know, saying you adults are being so irresponsible. And I, there can be a feeling of helplessness from you being there while the while the rhino is killed to like the grander thing of like i can behave as well as i possibly can and and yet do i have the power enough to change it i think you i think we do have the power to change it and it's it's the inconvenience of certainly changing things that that's the hardest we're just on the verge of banning trophy hunting in the uk and so they're going to stop these big game hunters going into Africa and pillaging and bringing that stuff back. If we do that, then we can lead by example. There's another thing as well, which I've seen, which has been really encouraging is, and I don't want to tell people don't eat meat, don't eat fish. Don't do that because that's, that's crazy stuff. You have to plant the seed and you have to educate people as to why we can't do that. If it's a choice, we all have a choice to do what we want to do. But what I've seen over the years in America is freezer cabinets have been extending for plant-based food and it's becoming something more of a choice. In the UK, half of the supermarket is plant-based and you go back and you think, wow, this is great, everybody's got it, you know, sausage rolls and pasties made of fake mints and you know all this stuff it's just beautiful food so i i go into supermarkets and i i see this stuff growing and getting bigger and so the demand is getting greater it's not getting greater fast enough but it it's getting there and my hope is 
the change will happen from that because rainforests and things that I've recorded in, 20 years ago I was in Rio de Janeiro and the rainforest was just across the road from this restaurant. It's 750 kilometers away now in 20 years. And it's being cleared because we're having to feed cattle with soya and we need the land for all there. So we can reverse that. Have a look at Chernobyl, you know, when that spill happened and everybody got the hell out of there because of the, the radioactive situation. But all the animals came back, all the trees started growing, the environment started, the, there was an ecosystem now that has got this beautiful soundscape. I recorded Chernobyl 10 years after the, the disaster and it sounds like paradise. So we can bring those things back, but we just need to make better choices. Yeah. So tell me, since we've just talked about so many horrible things, tell me something really beautiful that you've experienced. Wow, that's hard. That is so hard. I, I, th I think the birth in spring is beautiful. To listen to newborn animals, soundscapes that, that are there, the song of a of a songbird. Jeez, Katie, that's hard stuff to say. I mean, there's, there are so many beautiful, beautiful things. I live, fortunately, just across the road from a beach here. And between uh, May and October, we have three species of turtle laying eggs. So I go over the road and they come across at night and they lay their eggs and then 45 50 days later you watch these little hatchlings go back to the ocean you're watching it monitor it and helping it and with the hope that this guy is going to come back in 20 years time and lay its eggs you know there's so much beauty out there we just need to open our eyes you know the smell of a flower the buzz of a bee the grunt of a bear Anything you see that is wild and free and able to live side by side with us is, is beautiful. We look at birds and we buy binoculars and we go and watch them and count them and we, we write them down and we send them off to Cornell and say this is this, that and the other. We need to do that with flowers and wasps and insects and spiders and bugs. Not so much mosquitoes, but, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yes, yes. People who are longtime listeners to this show, some of whom even, like, send me articles all the time, know that I'm a huge spider fan and that I really feel like we need to rehab our, our view toward them. And we have, of course, a very strong policy in the house I live in that if you see a spider, you know, you just need to turn around for 20 seconds and turn back around and most likely you won't see it again. <laughs> so That's a good philosophy. And I've also been, you know, trying to think that we do so much on our phones and whatnot that it's sometimes even in bird watching just in your own backyard, you know, to think about that bird as being like your resident bird, like your neighbor. I told you I stuck a feeder on my office window. And so as we're talking, the birds are coming back and forth. Yes. I kind of like to think about it in that way that, you know, it's not just miscellaneous birds. These are the birds that live at my house and know that this feeder is got the goods in it, you know, and they come by every single day to check it out. It's wonderful to do it. It's, you know, I think in the old days they used to put aquariums in doctor's surgeries so you could watch fish go back and forward mm -hmm. and seeing birds go to a feeder is like an achievement suddenly you know but we need to say okay the squirrels need to eat too so let them leave them be mm -hmm. and everything else that's around just keep it keep it going and just it's it's fun to me it's better than watching tv yeah i would agree i told you we had a snow in seattle recently and uh my whole backyard was full of bunny tracks. I knew that there were rabbits in the neighborhood, but I didn't know that this many were passing through <laughs> at any given time. So now I know the secret is out. Well, you mentioned, I, since we're kind of running out of time, you did mention that you have received a fairly awful diagnosis lately. Yes. Why don't we tell everybody what that's about? Well, it was um, 
It was a year last April. I got my dog. His name's Sprocket, and he was going to be euthanized. And there were people telling me, "Can you go? You know, how far away from this this home are you that you can go and save it?" And I, I turned up to see if I could get him, and they told me he was already put down. And then she said, "Oh no, it's not. He's still here." So I grabbed my dog and. At that time, I started to feel pains, and I thought there was something not right. And I went for blood tests, and my PSA levels were through the roof. And I discovered that I they did a biopsy on my prostate, and they told me I got prostate cancer. And I had prostate cancer in Scotland in 1994, and I fought that off. You know, I. So I kind of thought I'm going to be okay because I know how to beat it, and I beat it. I knocked it back, and I PSA levels went down. I had seeds put in there, and I was nurturing a garden down in my prostate and all radioactive stuff. And then in、um, December of a year last December, 2020. They told me that it had metastasized into my bones, and that there wasn't a cure for it.、And、there was a tumor on my hip, and、uh, it was the size of a, I believe, a golf ball. I went through thirty, thirty-five different radiation treatments. God knows how many chemo things. Lost my hair, grow back, and lost my hair, and did all that. And they gave me three to five years to live, so I started researching a lot of things. And then between December and May of last year, my growth had gone eighteen percent, which was alarming. They said if this rate continues the way it is, you've got thirteen, fifteen months to live. And.、Uh, I went to a place called MD Anderson, which is up in Jacksonville here, and I had these infusions and I had all these treatments and I, I religiously did what they told me to do.、Um, and from May until December, my growth has been one point nine percent. So it's been a total of twenty percent for the year, which is high. But from May to December was one point nine percent. Which I managed to keep down. The pain is excruciating. The、um, the the bone cancer is like this crushing thing, and I stand up like an old man, you know, and I I try and straighten up as I walk away. But I I've got a a fantastic environment. I can walk over to the beach and sit there and listen to the waves crashing, and it's kind of therapeutic. And I have some amazing friends, and you know I get to see lots of people, lots of caring people. The、um, social media is incredible. You're incredible. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm humbled by it, and I believe I'll find a way. That I'll turn over every stone I possibly can, and I'll find a cure for it. And I'll show the doctors that you know you can't always be right.、You've、got to be wrong sometime. And I'll I'll show them, I'll show them I can do it. I like that plan. And what has that meant for your work? It's、or? immobilized me. I stopped doing a lot, but we have this project with Platoon, which is、um, we created a foundation and a trust called the Listening Planet. What I want to do is I want to teach kids how to record in the field. I want them to get out there. And I'll give them recording gear and microphones and set them up, take them there, and if I can keep my strength up and stuff, I shall start doing classes and taking them to places that you know, you know, people just dream about and go and record nature and sit there in the woods, burn a fire and just listen to beautiful, because even insects, you know, insect choruses are gorgeous. Things that make noises apart from man. Is a beautiful sound. My hope is that you know I can keep the foundation. I've donated my sounds to that. So what I want to do is 
have it available academically to people who need to do research rather than sell it for whatever it is you know it's it's priceless to me because there's so many things there that are just gone by the wayside and I think if it benefits somebody and it, and it's a tool to help save self-destruction then so be it hmm. yeah I love that would you have a suggestion of where you think I should go well, you're always welcome. You're always welcome down to Florida. Yes, where in Florida are you? I didn't even ask. I'm south of about a mile south of Cape Canaveral. So yesterday they launched another rocket, you know, and it just shot off. So you can see the rocket fly off from the house. Wow. But the the Everglades are um, three hours away. Hmm. That's a beautiful place. Well, uh, so the listeningplanet.com for anybody who wants to look at the at your website, expressing the voice of the natural world through sound, I think is your quote for it, which I love. And I do love this idea. I mean, maybe just to end this idea of that listening to animals is as important as seeing them, because I know that people make the argument that we need a zoo so that people appreciate the animals like there's empathy built by being able to see them in person that's one of the arguments that you often hear when it comes to zoos but but this idea that hearing them is just as valuable well zoos to me are a cop-out and the thing we've learned about captivity is that animals shouldn't be in captivity and when you see elephants dancing they're not being taught by the trainer they're they're going through this stereotypical behavior which it, it equates to boredom I've seen mountain gorillas in environments where sound is being played of lowland mountain gorillas and it, it's distressful, it's horrible. So zoos, in, the idea of having a zoo is to educate you. We've got technology now where we can get virtual animals on your screens if you want to see what's going on and stop using zoos as an educational tool when it's really somewhere to take your kids I did something at, at London Zoo years ago and I timed how many people spend at each exhibit and it's 50 seconds. So is it worth capturing a cheetah or a lion or a bear or whatever just for 50 seconds so it can live in this concrete jungle? It's horrible. It's horrible. You said that you got great comfort from going home, going home to the UK specifically. Yes. Do you ever think about going home or why have you not? Why have you stayed living abroad this whole time? We left Seattle in 2018 in the January and I went down to uh, Costa Rica and we built a home down there. I built this dream studio and I was working with people like Peter Gabriel and Sting and the studio was from the ground up. It was just fantastic. It was gorgeous. And I ended up in Florida because mainly because of my illness. And me and my wife kind of parted. We were great friends. But she stayed down in Costa Rica. Um, why don't I go back to the UK now? Well, I tell you the truth. I really want to go back and buy one of these barges on the river. And I dream about getting a wide beam, 60 foot, 70 foot boat, just sailing down the Rhine in France. Mm. I'm not giving that up, but I'm bungee corded really to the hospital still while I have this uh, treatment. So I'm tied to America really for health reasons. But as soon as they give me the, the green flag, I'll be on a boat. And I'll give you the address where to, to come. Okay, that sounds like a deal. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's Thank you. fun to see you again. And uh, I will put a link to your website in our show notes if anyone's interested. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell.